Hello and welcome back to the channel. We talk horror here. If that's something you enjoy, please consider liking and subscribing. Today we're doing another 10 underrated modern horror films. I think these films are going to be a little more fun than the ones I've talked about in my previous two videos. There's definitely more serious films on this list as well, but in general, I tried to keep uh, keep the films a, a little more lighthearted this time. Let's just get into it. Leaving DC was recommended to me by multiple people after I did my big ranking of the found footage films. I watched so many found footage movies in preparation for that video that I'm only now getting around to watching the films people left in the comments. I can see why this movie has such a small, passionate fan base. I'm, I'm glad it was recommended to me. I've actually been getting back into this type of really minimalist found footage lately. The majority of this film is just one person in a house in the middle of nowhere. He moves to this location and begins hearing strange noises at night and decides to investigate them through audio and video recordings. The framing here is that he's sending these videos to his friends that are still in DC. I was worried I wasn't going to be engaged with it because the story is so small scale and there's really only one character, uh, but it ended up really working for me. The audio recordings were especially creepy, I thought. There's not a single jump scare in the film too, which I thought was really neat. Because of the lack of traditional scares, I could definitely see someone watching this and saying, man, nothing happened in that movie. And, and, and that's a criticism uh, I hear over and over again about found footage, you know, ever since the Blair Witch Project. But if you have a fondness for this stuff, I think there's a lot to like in this movie. I got really sucked into the atmosphere of it, and it's only around 80 minutes long, so it doesn't overstay its welcome. Welcome. If you've been in the horror community a while, you will have probably heard about Pontypool. Ever since it came out in 2008, people have been calling this a hidden gem. So much so that I was thinking about not including it on the list, because if everyone says a movie is a hidden gem, is it really a hidden gem? That's why it wasn't included in the first two parts of this series, but I actually did some digging and realized that this movie does not have a lot of votes on Letterboxd and IMDb. So I'm gonna go ahead and count it. This is a zombie movie that mostly takes place inside of one location, a local radio station in the small Canadian town of Pontypool. So while there's all this chaos going on outside, the host of the radio show and his producers are reporting on what's going on without actually knowing a whole lot. They take calls from listeners and a, a reporter in the field, and they even end up on the BBC as international news organizations starts picking up the story. You don't actually see a lot in the movie, and it's for the better. The sense of isolation this movie manages to create is simply magnificent. The few times we are actually shown shots of the outside, uh, the visibility is extremely limited due to heavy snowfall and darkness. The sound design here is also excellent as you hear panicked screams coming off in, in the distance. And uh, the whole movie is literally about sound, so uh, that was probably the most important thing for them to get right, and they nailed it. Once you get to the reveal of what's actually going on, I must admit that it's a little goofy when you think about it, but I think it works in the context of the movie. Without spoiling anything, I'll just say that they do a little bit of a spin on the zombie formula, and that seems to be the most polarizing thing about the movie. But even so, I think this is a prime example of a film that does a lot with very little. It turns out your movie goes a long way if you just have good characters and really kick-ass sound design. The first two movies were both pretty minimalist in their execution, so let's talk about something completely different. The Tension is an all-in-your-face slasher comedy from 2011 that is so absurd, I can't help but love it. This is in the reign of movies like The Final Girls, Happy Death Day, Happy Death Day to You, Totally Killer, and It's a Wonderful Knife. Come to think of it, we've gotten a lot of these types of movies, but the tension predates all those other movies I named. It's also way more insane than those films. Telling you the plot of this movie doesn't really do its justice. If you read a plot outline, it will tell you that this movie is about a group of high school students stuck in detention while a masked killer is on the loose in the school. And I guess that's technically correct, but that's not really what the movie is. To explain this further, I'm just going to tell you some vague things that happen in the movie. These aren't spoilers, by the way. They're just elements of the story. There's time travel. 
a movie within a movie in fourth wall breaking with characters literally talking to the audience. There is a character who throws up acid like Jeff Goldblum in The Fly and has a TV for a hand. Literally the first line in the movie is a reference to the band Hoobastank. This movie does not give a fuck. And I have a feeling some people are going to find it insufferable. I think it's very charming though, and its heart is in the right place. Shanley Caswell and Josh Hutcherson plays the leads, and their chemistry helps bring the film down to earth a little bit in the more heartfelt moments. Hopefully by this description you'll be able to tell if the movie is for you or not, because I think you need to go into this with the right mindset. And not because it's bad, it's just so out there. Santa's Slay is another absolutely unhinged comedy slasher, where professional wrestler Bill Goldberg plays a murderous Santa Claus. The plot is pretty nonsensical here, so you, you just have to know that Santa is very bad and it's up to two teenagers in a small town to stop him. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that this is some high art that everyone has to see, but if you want a really stupid comedy with some great kills, it doesn't get much more fun than this. The comedy in this film operates on dude wears my car level of stupidity. I think that level of really silly comedy mixed with the gross out violence and the fact that Bill Goldberg is literally doing wrestling moves on innocent bystanders dressed as Santa Claus, it's really appealing to me. I know it's a little strange to be recommending a Christmas movie in February, but honestly I can throw this movie on all year round. This is one that's in the regular rotation for me and that probably says something about my mental state, but, but here we are. Uh, as with the tension, you can probably figure out if you're going to hate this movie just from the description and trailer, but if the concept sounds at all appealing to you, I highly recommend it. I mean, never say never, but this is probably the dumbest movie I'm ever going to recommend to you guys. Definitely, as I said, not high art, but I just, I think it's so delightful. Mayhem is directed by Joe Lynch, whose whole filmography I think is worth digging into, but this is by far the best thing he's ever done. I actually rewatched Wrong Turn 2 Dead End last week because I thought about putting that one on the list instead, and while I still had fun with that movie, it maybe hasn't aged the best. So we're going with Mayhem, even though that's a little more well known. This was an early Shutter original starring Steven Yeun and Samara Weaving, whom I both adore. They are both great here, as they are finding their way up a high rise filled with zombie like office workers. Basically, there's an out break of a virus that makes people act on all of their impulses, and because of this the building will be locked down for 8 hours. It's kind of a video game-esque setup here. Uh, they explain it a bit more in the film, but it's not important for me to go into all of those details. You've probably seen other movies like this, so you get the gist. Not only is this a very entertaining action-horror hybrid, but it's also a really fun satire on corporate office jobs. This came out around the same time as the Belko experiment, and the two films have a lot in common when it comes to those elements. It's very on-the-nose satire, of course, but I think that has its place too. Office jobs can be pretty cushy, but sometimes they just make you want to scream, and I think this film captures that energy perfectly. I also want to note that I think the casting for both Samara Weaving and Steven Yeun are great, as they don't necessarily look like they can kick a lot of ass, like if you just look at them, but also when they are in roles with a lot of action, and there's a lot of physicality, you believe that they can do those things. Like, it's very uh, it's very smart the way they, they've casted this movie, and I'm sure, I mean, they, they've both done amazing things since this movie came out, so um, it, th this one has aged really well. I think. The Void is one of those films that's most easily described by comparing it to other films because it wears its inspirations on its sleeve. That's actually something I've seen the film be criticized for because it's maybe not the most original thing in the world, but I don't know, I, I have a soft spot for these types of movies. You know, last episode I recommended VFW, and this is definitely kind of in that same vein. It's part Assault on Precinct 13, but set inside a hospital, part creature feature and part cosmic horror. 
It's heavily inspired by 80s movies, so most of the effects are done practically, and they look great. Most things in the film do, actually. There's this cult outside the hospital, and they're keeping the characters in there, and the cult has this really cool look to them. This has more style than substance, sure, uh, but I think the style is damn good. Also, this is a little hard to talk about without spoiling it, but I like the way this movie plays around with different subgenres of horror. The majority of the film plays out like a high-octane, you know, action horror f film, but then when you get to the ending, it starts going in a more cosmic direction, and some of the visuals there get really trippy. It's like you're watching a completely different film, but it all fits together. I'm a big fan of this one. The Clove Hitch Killer is a 2018 serial killer horror film that really took me by surprise. It's about a 16-year-old boy who starts suspecting that his father is the titular Clove Hitch Killer, a famous uncaught serial killer who previously terrorized their town. In the first version of this script, I called the film a mystery, but come to think of it, it's pretty clear what's going on right from the get-go. The son finds some pretty incriminating evidence straight from the get-go, which sounds like it would destroy the tension of the film, but it actually enhances it. Dylan McDermott plays the father, and he does so perfectly. You immediately start to second-guess everything he does, because every conversation he has feels so meticulously planned out. At worst, he's this serial killer in disguise with a family, and, and he goes to church and all the, these things, right? But at best, he's hiding a very dark part of himself from the rest of his family, a part that only his son knows about. The film feels very realistic, in a way that's uh, kind of uncomfortable. It, it seems like it could have been based on a real case, but it's not. Uh, it just it, it has that vibe. A key component of this film is that the family are Christians, and uh, they're pretty much only surrounded by like-minded people, and that part really did feel um, especially realistic to me. You know, people who live these types of like double lives tend to find the perfect cover in communities like these. The film also hits on some familiar notes of the coming of age genre, such as loss of innocence, finding yourself, sexual awakenings, and or repressions. Uh, this is a very unsettling movie, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Rogue is one of those films that is way better than it has any right to be. The poster makes it look like one of those sci-fi original monster movies, and while it certainly has a bit of that DNA, this is actually quite clever. It's about a group of tourists on a boat tour in Australia that get attacked by a giant crocodile. It's directed by Greg McLean, who did both of the Wolf Creek films, and his stuff always looks really good, and this is no exception. The locations in this film are gorgeous. But what really makes the film work is the human drama and the connection that form between this group of strangers. It takes about 30 minutes for the action to start, and there's a lot of characters, so we don't get to know them super well, but they use that time well, uh, setting up the dynamics of the group. Another thing that I think is really smart from a writing perspective is that they never explain how this crocodile is so gigantic and why it is hunting them. Because, first of all, who, who cares, right? Uh, second of all, there's never going to be a satisfying answer to that question that is not going to come across as incredibly cheesy. And that's the beauty of horror, I think. Some things are better kept in the dark. Now, don't get me wrong, this is definitely still a movie about a giant crocodile killing people, so they deliver on the action as well. The deaths come quickly as people are dragged underwater, never to be seen again. In the last part of the movie, that's where they start to show the crocodile a little bit more, and maybe that's the, that's the part of the movie that hasn't aged the greatest, because some of the CGI looks a little wonky by today's standards. Uh, but even so, I think this is well worth a watch if you can stand some, some CGI from 2007. She Will is a 2021 supernatural horror film set in the Scottish countryside. We follow an older actress who is recovering from a double mastectomy and her nurse. Their plan was to stay isolated throughout the, the recovery period after the surgery, but when they get to the location, they realize that there are other people staying there as well, and that group seems to be part of some kind of artist collective. I don't know, they go into the woods and paint and shit. What they do there is never fully explained. Uh, anyways, uh, during their stay, she begins having these vivid nightmares that seem related to the area's history with witchcraft. 
left. Explaining the plot more than that feels redundant, as the film is very heavy on vibes. The first thing you see in the credits is that the film is produced by Dario Argento, and this film definitely manages to scratch some of the same itches his films do. The dream sequences here that make up a lot of the movie are fantastic. There's a good balance here between surrealist imagery and moving the plot forward. There's one sequence in particular featuring Malcolm McDowell on a talk show that I thought was extraordinary. The story here is maybe not super unique. You will sort of figure out where it's going and what the story is doing with the, the message and everything like that. Um, but the way it's told here through these dream sequences is what makes it unique. I also have to say that I like the bond between the two main characters a lot, uh, the actress and her nurse. And I maybe wish there was a little bit more of that stuff, um, because this is a very quiet movie, and even though the dialogue is quite sharp uh, when the characters are actually talking to each other, uh, there's not a lot of it. And because of that, I don't think this movie is going to be for everyone. But if you want to sit back for 90 minutes and watch something that's kind of trippy, you could do a whole lot worse. I, I, I think the visuals in this one make it worth watching. Starry Eyes is one of those movies that hasn't left my brain since the first time I saw it. It came out in 2014 and it's about an aspiring actress who is at her end's meet. Her friends are all super shallow, she pays the bill by waiting tables, and she's barely holding it together at the start of this movie. Without going into too much detail, after an audition, she ends up performing sexual favors for a big shot Hollywood producer, and after that, a body horror nightmare begins. I guess you could say this movie is about selling your soul to the devil, but I don't really like the way that sounds. It's more about the consequences of a system that only lets people succeed if they sell their soul to the devil. It's about the way the entertainment industry will chew you up and spit you out, especially if you're a young woman. On a personal note, I think this movie speaks to me because I've had my own aspirations of working in the entertainment industry. Those aspirations were not necessarily always me thinking that I was going to be this performer, right? Um, but for a really long time, I wanted to work uh, professionally with film. I first studied film theory, and then I got into the practical side of things and saw how people further down the ladder were treated, and I ended up dropping out. That's not a decision I regret, because I did not feel like I could be part of that dog-eat-dog -dog world. It made me so stressed out and angry, uh, and I feel like that's the exact same energy Starry Eyes has. There is a rawness to the body horror and violence in this film that feels like it's coming from a very dark place. The allegory of the main character literally shedding her own skin to usher in this new fame and fortune is maybe a bit on the nose but I still think it works. This is also a film where it's a little hard to talk about the story because it's really the third act that brings everything together. Uh, so if you find yourself sort of wondering wh where, the th where it's going to go, uh, just stick with it because the, the last act of the movie gets really, really crazy. And that's all the movies I had this time. I know films like Pontypool, Starry Eyes, and Mayhem aren't the most hidden, but I also think I would be doing the films a disservice if I wasn't including them on the list, if that makes sense. As the, the series is going to keep going, we're going to go into more and more obscure films, but these were films that I really, really like, and it, it, you know, it feels weird excluding them just because... Well, some people know about them. You know, it's easy to get stuck in semantics with these lists, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, thanks for watching. 